how many of you have been to a talk on compassion fatigue before? Wow, okay, a bunch of you. Um, so um, I think and, and I hope since many of you have looked at this topic, um, my approach is a little bit different than uh, most of the other ones, at least that I've been to. Um, I'm not a social worker, psychologist, don't have any of, of those type of um, degrees or training, but I approach it as a veterinarian and, and it is an evidence-based look. And, and for me, what helps me understand this concept and why I think it, it, um, this talk resonates with a lot of people is because um, I want to understand the why, the why behind um, this problem, and what do we know about, what are the facts, and how can we use that information to help ourselves be productive in our careers and help our colleagues be productive. So um, a little bit of a different take maybe than you've seen before, so hopefully that um, uh, you appreciate that and that resonates with you guys as well. So I think um, a lot of times when we hear uh, compassion fatigue, many of us, our first thoughts go towards suicide um, and the rates of suicide in veterinarians. And there's been a lot of press and discussion about that over the past few years, as, as there should have been. Um, but one thing I want to emphasize is that there's a kind of a whole spectrum of um, problems and concerns that can arise that can be related or tied somehow to compassion fatigue. So, um, you know, I've got a couple of headlines here, like I showed you last time, I like to kind of pull these things out and see what people are thinking and talking about. Of course, there's one about suicide, but one, um, I don't know how many technicians are here, but there's this little um, e-card that's, you know, meant as a joke. If you, if you like being overworked, underappreciated, and underpaid, become a veterinary technician today. Um, so, you know, that it, it's, um, we all kind of understand where that's coming from, but it may be something as simple as, um, you know, feeling that way in your, in your daily life. The other thing, here's a blog post that I found somewhere about I'm an angry, depressed, anxiety-prone, and drunk veterinarian. And so it may be something like that, where there's substance abuse involved or anger or um, something not quite as extreme as suicide <coughs> yet or, or maybe at all. But um, there is a whole spectrum of um, signs and syndromes that we can see that might be related to this compassion fatigue idea. So um, what I hope to do in uh, this first part of the session um, there we, we will take a break when I get through the, the first part of it here, um, so don't worry about that, and then we'll, do the, we'll come back and, and um, dive into some pieces of it a little bit more. But this first part, I want to talk about what is compassion fatigue, and there's a lot of related terms that we kind of throw around interchangeably, and there are, there are some distinct differences that are, I think, important to know. Um, summarize, what, what does the data show about the impact of compassion fatigue and these related syndromes on caregivers and people in caregiving professions? And obviously, we'll focus on um, animal welfare and veterinary profession in particular. And then look at some of those specific risk factors for um, people who, who will develop mental illness, will develop compassion fatigue, and look at what we know about those things in, again, in animal care professions uh, in particular. So um, I'm going to go through a couple definitions here that are important that we'll talk about throughout the talk. Um, and like I said, there are some, some key distinctions that are important to know. One of these is stress and um, I like this picture, I actually don't remember where I got this from at one point, but um, this little graph that looks at stress and it, and it emphasizes the fact that stress can be good. Um, so you know there's this um, section down here where you have uh, performance is going up on this axis, stress level is going up on this axis. So you know this can be normal or good stress and we have healthy activities, peak performance somewhere in the middle and then we get into sort of the negative aspects of it where we have panic, anxiety, anger, burnout, breakdown. So um, most of the time when I talk about stress today, obviously I'm talking about the negative side of things, but one definition of stress is the emotional, mental, and physical strain. And this is, can be thought of as the result of too much, sort of the overwhelming feeling is too much of whatever, pressures and demands. Um, that's gonna contrast with, with some of the other terms that we talk about. Secondary traumatic stress is an important term, and often this is actually equated with compassion fatigue. And so it, it's very similar to the definitions that we have of compassion fatigue. Uh, and again, maybe actually uh, equated with it, but I think there are a little bit of, of separations as well. The important thing about this is these are symptoms that you yourself are experiencing. You didn't experience the trauma directly yourself, somebody else did, um, but you witnessed it or you heard about it. Uh, maybe this happens to us when we're listening to um, somebody describe um, watching an animal get hit by a car or some sort of traumatic event that happened to them or their pets. Uh, maybe witnessing animal cruelty when um, many iterations ago when I did the first kind of version of this talk, I was putting this together and I was like, okay, there's a great chance to put in a video. I found this video clip of, um, this was a real high profile case 
in New York City a few years ago where this man was caught on camera in an elevator beating his dog in the elevator. Um, and so I was kind of looking through the news articles and trying to find a clip and I realized like that's counterproductive. I'm giving myself secondary traumatic stress watching this video and I'm going to show it to everybody. So you get the idea, but it's symptoms that you experience from watching something else that happened. This could also be comforting a grieving client um, and how that impacts us as the practitioner. One that um, I've learned about uh, more recently in the last year or so, it, and I think it's, it's uh, a really important one, is it's called moral stress. How many have heard of moral stress? Okay, not, just not, not quite as many. I think this, this one really kind of hits home for me, and when I think about it, I see this uh, appearing in, um, in our field more and more frequently. So this is the stress that you feel from an inability to do what's right. And this is really important because when we talk about some, some of the um, normal man stress management techniques later, they may not impact um, how, how we feel about moral stress and how moral stress impacts us. So this is when there is something external to us that we can't control that limits what we can do, and in our case specifically, the care that we can provide. So maybe there's um, some law that's preventing us from doing something. Maybe there's an institutional policy where you work that prevents you from doing um, reporting cruelty or um, whatever it might be. So you know what's right in your mind and for you, what's, what is right to do, but you can't do it. Maybe it's because of a cost limitation. Um, you know, there's a, you make some recommendation for a treatment for an animal, a client can't afford that cost and there's that um, discrepancy there. Maybe there's a disagreement over the quality of life. You have one feeling and the other party has another feeling. Uh, I mentioned reporting suspicions of cruelty. Um, euthanasia decisions obviously is a big one. If, if there's a disagreement between the veterinarians, maybe even the technicians um, and the clients, whether it be a shelter animal, um, shelter management, or, or a privately owned client, um, that's a huge component of um, what we're going to talk about today. Here's another important term called vicarious trauma. And so this is um, the cumulative negative effect of secondary traumatic stress. So again, not happening directly to you, but this is what happens to you as a result of dealing with what's happening to other people. And it results in a change in worldview. And so when I first learned about this, um, there was a, a little um, like an excerpt from a book chapter that um, was shared with us. And the book is called Trauma Stewardship. <coughs> And actually, I'm just going to, I have it here, I'm just going to read a couple, a little portion of what this author said. And this author is, I believe she was a, social, uh, um, a social worker or a psychologist, and she had worked a lot in um, high trauma environments, so like um, in emergency rooms and dealt with a lot of really dramatic cases of child abuse and sexual abuse and disaster response to some really horrible stuff, and she had done this for many years. And so she's writing this book about trauma stewardship, and she recognized in herself um, vicarious trauma in this way, and that's how she describes it. She says, we were visiting our relatives in the Caribbean. We had hiked to the top of some cliffs on a small island, and for a moment the entire family stood quietly together, marveling, looking out at the sea. It was an exquisite sight. There was turquoise water as far as you could see, a vast cloudless sky, and air that felt incredible to breathe. As we reached the edge of the cliffs, my first thought was, this is unbelievably beautiful. My second thought was, I wonder how many people have killed themselves by jumping off these cliffs. And so that was the, the kind of realization for her that like something is different the way that she sees the world, the way that other people see the world. And the example that I always give <coughs> that I think hits home with a lot of us is you're driving along the side of the road um, and you see a cardboard box. What do we all think? There's kittens in the box. We have to go save the kittens, right? Um, what do most people think? <laughs> like there's trash on the side of the road, right? So. Um, we've all had examples of finding the kittens in there, and it may be multiple times, and that's resulted in a change in our worldview. So we kind of look at things through a different lens than uh, most people when you're suffering from vicarious trauma. Um, okay, burnout. This is one that I often um, hear people uh, confusing with compassion fatigue, and for me, this is a very different thing. And so burnout um, is a response to excessive stress in the work environment. Um, it can be manifested by exhaustion, apathy, negativity, it's uh, sort of, so when we compare it about stress being too much of things and being overwhelmed, burnout is sort of that not enough. It's just apathetic, don't care. Um, some of the common kind of signs that you see is coming in late, calling in sick, complaining, being detached from patients, clients, coworkers. Um, the important aspect of this definition here and why it's really different from compassion fatigue is that this is related to the environment that you're in. So um, not to jump too far ahead, but you can alter the environment and potentially impact um, how you're feeling about 
burnout, if that's something that you're suffering from. Whereas with compassion fatigue, it's, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so then what is compassion? Um, understanding of the difficult situation of another, and the key piece of that is that it actually incites action. So not only you know, do you, do you um, have that empathy or have that sympathy and understand what's going on, you actually take action to do something. So you see the pathetic animal in the shelter, you get them out, you fix them up, and you get them adopted. You respond to natural disasters. You engage with the community and offer help where you can. There's actually an action component to it. And so when we get on to compassion fatigue, to me, I think it has qualities of all of these different terms that we talked about. And I don't think there's a real clear definition there. There's a lot of overlap. And they're all important things, important components of that. But they have these kind of little differences that are, that are key to sort of figuring out how you're going to deal with it in, in your career. And that's an important thing to know. So here's this kind of a collection of some of the definitions of compassion fatigue itself that you see in the literature. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'll read a couple of them to you. It, the, the natural result of continuing exposure to the suffering of others. Um, normal displays of chronic stress resulting from caregiving work. And I highlight those two, and you'll see it in almost all of these definitions here. There's two things that um, come out of it is it's, it's a normal or natural sort of expected response to the work that we're doing. Um, and it's uh, exposure, um, secondary type of exposure. So it's not necessarily things that are happening to you. It's the way that you feel as a result of this normal expected thing. And because it's normal and expected, then we need to um, take steps to mitigate the effects. So as I alluded to earlier, as long as you continue working in a helping profession, <coughs> compassion fatigue will follow you. So just changing jobs is maybe that will work for burnout if that's your particular thing. Um, but if you're still um, providing care and being in a helping profession, and we see this across many professions, not just in animal-related fields, um, compassion fatigue is going to be something that you want to um, pay attention to and, and mitigate any effects on your life and take steps to prevent yourself from the detrimental effects of it. Okay, so we'll look um, briefly at some of the, um, the data on other caregiving professions. And there's a number of studies on registered nurses, um, child protection uh, workers, ER, uh, ER nurses, disaster relief folks. You can see some of the um, prevalence of what in, in these studies, compassion fatigue symptoms. They all might have had like a slightly different definition of what that is. Um, but I just want to kind of give you an idea of the scope of some of these um, similar signs and symptoms that we see across these different types of fields that all share that sort of caregiving uh, link with one another. We can look a little bit more specifically at animal shelters in general because this is something that we've, we've kind of known about as, as an issue in some form or another in animal shelters and we've been talking about it there a lot longer than we've talking, been talking about it in regular, uh, regular veterinary medicine as a whole um, and in other, other aspects of, of caregiving work. And one of the papers that um, many of you probably have seen is what they call the caring killing paradox. And in this paper, they um, talked about euthanasia related strain. And so that had uh, a number of similarities to the various definitions and components of compassion fatigue that I, that I mentioned earlier. And in this particular study, um, what they did was they surveyed animal shelter workers engaged in regular euthanasia practice. I, I believe this was at an HSUS Expo years ago, is where they collected the data. Um, and they asked, they, they wanted to answer two questions. One, what is the prevalence of what they called euthanasia related strain in this population of people? And what were the specific work characteristics that are associated with their well being? And so you can see kind of the spread of um, findings here. This is the percentage of employees who agree or strongly with agree with the series of statements that they were given. But, you know, really high percentages, over 40%, for things like um, describing their lives as, as like emotionally feel like. Um, they were hit by a truck, have a great amount of stress about their work, just thinking about their, their work is stressful, um, influences their happiness with their life, often have trouble concentrating. So a really high proportion of these individuals surveyed um, had some negative impact. Then they looked at um, some of those associations with well-being. And, and one thing that they found, so they, they looked at substance abuse, associations with substance abuse, and, and with work-family conflict. And they found a negative association, so less substance abuse, as the number of animals and the length of euthanasia sessions went up, and a positive association, more uh, substance abuse, as the hours per week engaged in euthanasia went down. The other thing that they found was that with work-family conflict, positive association, so more work-family conflict as the frequency of euthanasia went up. So 
Um, we can kind of take a little practical tidbit out of that is that it seems like one longer euthanasia session is better than frequent smaller sessions when it at least comes to these two things in that particular study. So that may be some of the reasons behind the way that we schedule and manage um, euthanasia in, in shelters. So then looking a little bit more closely at veterinarians, um, I, I think, at least for me, it seemed like this first became sort of widespread, um, a widespread discussion in um, early 2013 when this um, morbidity and mortality report came out about the JAMA study that was to follow in 2015. So in this study, over 11,000 veterinarians were surveyed um, and they, asked, they were asked about their experiences with depression and suicidal behavior and they used a standardized um, psychological distress scale to, to rank them. And as I said, the full study was published in, in 2015, so we got a lot more details at that point about the findings. And so just a couple of the highlights were um, the overall um, proportion was that one in 11 veterinarians surveyed suffered from serious psychological distress according to the scale that they used. And those, particularly those that were in shelter practice, those that were associate veterinarians versus um, uh, practice owners, and those that were in practice less than 20 years had higher rates of serious psychological distress. They also found when it related to suicidal behavior, one in six veterinarians had experienced suicidal thoughts. Um, and those that were in small animal practice, shelter practice, exotic practice, those doing relief work, those that were in that 10 to 19 year range, and those that worked by themselves were at greater risk for that. Um, and so I put on the bottom sort of the, the scales here, um, veterinarians that were in this survey, the percentage that suffered psychological distress, depressive episodes, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts are over here, males, females, compared to the U.S. population surveys that were available at the time, males and females. And so in general, um, you see that the proportions are higher for veterinarians, also in general higher for females uh, as compared to males. So um, another study that was done, um, this is uh, based on a systematic uh, review of a variety of, of research that was done to, to kind of answer this question and find out what did we know about this question, looking at mental health, stress, and burnout in particular in veterinarians. I believe this was actually in the, um, the UK. And so they found not all bad news. So they found there's actually little evidence overall across all these studies of poor mental health or exceptionally high stress in veterinarians. There were groups that they identified as being at increased risk for those three things, um, particularly females, those that were younger, and those that were working alone. So we're starting to see a little bit of overlap between some of the various studies that have been done in different parts of the world and in, in different time periods as well. Um, they looked at the specific, they, so they categorized what were the things that actually um, resulted in more uh, stress and more burnout in those veterinarians. They categorized them in different ways. And, there were occupational factors and there were psychological factors that were associated with higher stress. And so some of those occupational factors, having a uh, managerial responsibility, working long hours, working heavy workload, having poor life, work life balance, things that are not probably not super surprising to find in that, in that category. The euthanasia one is interesting. We'll come back to that a little bit in a moment. Um, and then psychological categories, those that had um, an internal locus of control is the term that they use, meaning that they really personalize and, and you know, took in internalized and personalized success or failure. Um, anything that happened where they really absorbed that and it became their fault, those are folks that are more likely to have uh, higher stress in the study. And then they found that the individual coping style of the individuals impacted that as well. And so they said that those that had a more detached coping style um, were less likely to have higher stress than those that had a more emotional coping style. And they, they also identified that uh, males were more likely to have the detached style versus females were more likely to have the emotional style. All right, so um, this actually goes back to, this is a newer study that just came out um, this year, but it uses the same data set of the 11,000 veterinarians that were surveyed with that first study that I showed you. And they looked at what are some of those factors again. They actually took all the um, sort of freestyle responses that people wrote in on some of the survey questions and categorized them to see you know, what were the, the key issues that were uh, of concern. Um, and so that was a study that looked at psychological distress scale and suicidal uh, ideation. And so what they found, they did a quantitative piece and a qualitative piece. It's not um, super important for this. But the individual things that they figured out were ha the demands of practice played a role. Professional mistakes uh, played a role in how, sh uh, how distressed folks were. Um, client complaints, financial insecurity, client issues, again, shows up on the qualitative side, interpersonal issues, and work-life balance. So 
again, we're starting to see patterns in some of the things that are here, and that can kind of inform how we move forward and how we address these things. All right, so um, probably the last study to uh, come out. How many have read this Merck, uh, Merck study? This was a pretty recent one. All right, so new to many people. So this was a big survey that was done, just published earlier in the year. Um, 3,540 working U.S. veterinarians, and their goals were to quantify the prevalence of mental illness in this population of U.S. veterinarians currently, identify which veterinarians were most at risk for mental illness, and try to figure out what were the influencing factors in that. And then they wanted to look a little bit beyond and actually measure well-being, which was a, a more broader term, um, looking at overall like outlook on life, um, and what were the influencing factors on where people fell on that well-being scale. So um, when it came to the mental health findings, two-thirds of the veterinarians surveyed reported depression, compassion fatigue, burnout, anxiety, or panic attacks within the last year. And so those definitions were whatever those folks thought, thought they were suffering from. So there um, you know, could be some uh, variation there. But two-thirds self-reported that they had experienced this recently. 5.3% um, experienced serious psychological distress within the last 30 days of taking that survey. And so what were the factors that played a role into those serious psychological distress cases? Very similar list again, increased hours per week, working evening hours, working more than desired, being in clinical practice versus other types of practice, and then um, doing poorly financially or, or having the perception that they were doing poorly financially played into that as well. And then the other thing that they looked at was the well-being. And so um, they had a nice graphic in there, so I just kind of pulled that out here. What you see is, all veterinarians, um, th so these are the, the study population here on the left, and this is the U.S. employed general population. So when they, when they do similar studies in the remainder of the U.S. population, overall sense of well-being, you know, you want to see people in the green, which means that they're, they're flourishing, they feel like they're flourishing overall in their life, versus this gray bar means they're just, they just feel like they're getting by, versus the red bar feel like they're suffering. So you can see um, in the group of veterinarians that was surveyed, Fewer of them, these were significant differences, fewer of them felt like they were flourishing compared to the general population. It was 58.3 here to 61 here. Um, more of them felt like they were in the suffering category, 9.1% versus 7.3% there. And then similarly, they pulled out the individual factors to try to figure out what uh, played into that. Those that had really high well-being had higher income, had fewer work hours, low or no debt. Um, they owned their practices didn't work evenings, and they were engaged in a variety of other activities um, that helped sort of uh, round out their life, so traveling, reading, spending time with family and friends, hobbies, exercising, being in a relationship, all those things were linked back with having high well-being in that data set. And then the two things that really stood out for those that were in the low well-being category were increased debt and being dissatisfied financially. So um, I think these, these more recent studies are interesting because it's um, we're starting to see a lot more impact about finances on the way that veterinarians are feeling, so that's, and that's bearing out in some of the data, which we didn't, either wasn't looked at before or we didn't see it before. I'm not sure which one it was. So I said I wanted to um, come back to euthanasia for a minute because I think that's an interesting one because I think uh, maybe some of us and, and probably a lot of the general population think that um, kind of all these mental health issues and all this discussion about compassion fatigue is related to the fact that we have to perform euthanasia. And, I'm not sure that that's um, necessarily the case, and there's really kind of mixed, mixed answers when you look at the literature on this. And so um, one study that I want to share with you asked the question, how often have you wanted to refuse euthanasia but not done so? So which of the terms on there is this question actually addressing? Yeah, so I heard a bunch of you say it. So it's, it's moral stress in particular. So they. They knew in their heads what was the right thing to do, the right thing for them, but they weren't able to do it. That's that moral stress question. So the veterinarians in this um, survey, it was, um, this was done in the UK. The most common, so this is the kind of the order of uh, common response, how often have you wanted to do this? Most of them said yearly, um, and then the next category was never, then monthly, then weekly. So uh, for most veterinarians, it was not that often that they were having this, this issue, as at least, really, at least related to euthanasia in particular. They took it a step further and wanted to figure out um, when you performed an objectionable euthanasia, meaning one that you, you didn't agree with the rationale for, um, what were the reasons for that? And they decided that there were kind of three groupings of that. 
there were animal related reasons, owner related reasons, and social, um, social influences. And so for animal related reasons, they felt like even though they didn't think that animal needed to or should have been euthanized, they felt that rehoming was inappropriate for one reason or another. There were concerns that the animal would be abandoned or would be abused, so they went ahead with what was for them an objectionable euthanasia. Um, owner related reasons, they were worried about the mental health of the owner and giving that animal back to an owner. Financial limitations of the owner, so those are probably cases where there was some sort of medical treatment that was needed that they couldn't afford or figure out a way of, of handling that situation. Uh, and the welfare of treatment, so there, there's veterinarians who, you know, maybe there was a treatment um, available, but there was concerns about the impact of that treatment itself on the animal and the animal's welfare. And then social um, influences and, and pressure from clients, supervisors, and peers were important. In another study that looked at a similar thing, the objectionable euthanasia, they actually found that that was not associated with mental health. So that's why I say there's kind of mixed evidence on this, this particular question. Um, they looked at the frequency of euthanasia and found that there was a weak positive correlation with depression, but it actually moderated the impact of suicide. So um, over on the, this axis here, we have the, um, the frequency of euthanasia. And so the darkest bars are the most frequent. Um, the middle bar is in between, and the light bar is, is least frequent. And the depression categories along the bottom, normal, mild, moderate, severe. So you can see, in general, it went up. Um, as depression went up, the frequency of euthanasia went up. So there was, you know, a weak positive correlation there. But um, the color, sorry, the colors, I didn't explain it clearly. The colors are, are the risk of uh, suicide risk. So even though overall the risk of depression went up, the risk of suicide went down. Kind of an unusual thing. I'm not sure there's a, a good explanation for it. But um, there's that, that conflict there. All right. So um, why are we talking about this in about veterinarians? Why does this come up in, in our profession, animal care profession, so much? And I think there's four main categories of, of reasons and, and four buckets that the reasons fall into. And so there's internal factors, um, things that are, are about our personalities and the way that we work, uh, particularly external factors that we may or may not have control over, things specific about veterinary medicine and, and working with animals, and then um, something called negativity bias, which is, um, you know, part of human condition in general. So internal factors, um, we have a high ability to experience emotions. So you guys know what mirror, neur mirror neurons are? This is the, so these guys are demonstrating it here for you. We, I, I learned about mirror neurons. You may have heard about it in um, learning about nonverbal non communication when you kind of mirror somebody's body language and to, to get them to open up or to close to shut down or whatever, you know, vice versa, to kind of control, uh, take control non-verbally of the situation, um, you can mirror somebody's body language and then they'll, they'll um, mirror you back. And so it turns out that works emotionally as well. So that's what these guys are demonstrating here. It turns out that works emotionally as well. So we're dealing with all these traumatic things in our daily lives and all these ethical questions. Um, we begin to, to internalize that because of the, the anatomy and the presence of these mirror neurons and the way that they work. Um, personality type is another one. So as veterinarians, we have a need to rescue or protect. That's just one of the characteristics that many of us share. Um, anybody who's done Myers-Briggs uh, personality test, many veterinarians fall under the thinking and feeling types. Does, it, does anybody know if that's, if that's them, if they fall under theirs? I think I'm in, I'm in I think the thinking, I don't, can't remember if I'm in the feeling one or not, but many veterinarians fall in that thinking and feeling type. A couple other internal factors that fit into there Ge in general. Um, there's a lack of assertiveness, difficulty saying no, lack of personal boundaries, um, wanting to be perfectionist, uh, having really high expectations of yourselves, and really feeling tied to your profession. So not um, being able to feel good about successes in other areas of your life. And just everything is tied back to your profession. Sensitivity to suffering, putting the needs of, of others above self. Anybody relate to any of the things on here? Pretty, pretty common, right? So. That's okay, and actually that's a good thing. Um, all these qualities are the things that actually make us good veterinarians. Um, that's why we're doing what we're doing and why we're able to do it and to do it well. But we have to recognize that these things also place us at high risk for compassion fatigue. So um, I've heard some people talk about compassion fatigue as an occupational hazard, and that kind of sets the, the idea for us that you know, we know this is a risk, um, so we can take, st take steps to mitigate that risk and prepare ourselves to deal with it when it, when it comes up. So what are some of the external factors that we may or may not have as much um, control over? Time constraints, everybody's pulled in many different directions. Continuous exposure to death and grief. 
Work-related stress, self-care is not valued. Um, that's that's a you know a big one in society. I think we're seeing that that change a little bit over the past few years. But um, in general, in society, self-care has not always been a very valued activity. Unresolved trauma is one that's gotten um, some more attention lately as well. And there's been a couple studies that looked at that. And so, uh, in particular, they're talking about ACEs or um, adverse childhood experiences. And so, what we find in the general population is that 64% um, of adults have one or more of these adverse childhood experiences, and it's um, all these guys over here. So the, the bigger piece of the pie um, has experienced is some of these ACEs. Excuse me. They're talking about abuse, um, household challenges, things like um, mental illness in the family or in the home environment, substance abuse, um, separation and divorce, things, things like that, um, and neglect is the other category. Abuse, household challenges, and neglect. And so um, Dr. Strand at University of Tennessee, who has um, the social work program there and does a lot of the a lot of work around compassion fatigue in veterinary medicine, she and her group led this study um, last year, I believe it was, in veterinary students. Um, they they did they surveyed over 1,100 veterinary students in six veterinary schools, um, and they they did a depression scale and a stress scale for these guys, and they wanted to find out were these ACEs a, a concern and playing a role here. And they found um, that exposure to ACEs was the same as the U.S. population. So the veterinary students in these studies were in the study were not any different as, as far as it came to um, the exposure to these adverse experiences. Those so in that subset, those that did have greater than or equal to four of them did have a much higher rate of uh, clinical depression and, and high stress. And the most common ACE that they found in the group of veterinary students was was living with a family with mental illness, family member with mental illness. So we have some veterinary specific factors as well that um, you guys are all familiar with, I'm sure. You guys have probably heard the, the um, saying about, you know, we see patients from womb to tomb, which is pretty, um, pretty unique across you know, all, the, all the healthcare fields. We're, we're probably one of the uh, very few, if not only ones that experience that. So we have just as much of a bond with many of these patients as their owners do. So maybe that secondary stress um, tips over into primary trauma and primary stress on, our, on ourselves. We can, of course, legally perform euthanasia, which carries a whole bunch of uh, baggage with it. Um, we also know how to do that, which is um, interesting when you start to look at the rates of suicide and suicide attempts and suicide successes. I'm sure that that plays a role as well. Access to drugs, um, because we're veterinarians, we have, we have DEA licenses and this sort of thing, and we know how to use those drugs. Exha exhaustion and availability is expected um, and encouraged. And um, this, one I always, this one always reminds me of when I was in vet school and when we were getting ready to um, go into our clinical rotations, it was a like it was a whole big deal and was a whole big kind of exciting day, and we were able to get our clinic phones. And you know, looking back on that, I don't, I don't, you know, like <laughs> we felt so important that we had the clinic phone that they, you know, they could get us at any time of day, and they ne we needed to be there and we needed to take care of it. And it was, you know, that was great. But um, that was sort of the culture that encourages exhaustion and availability at all times. I mean, Elizabeth talked about she's got her phone right here to respond to an outbreak that comes. So, um, you know, our society expects that of us. And self-care is, like I mentioned before, generally not, not encouraged. So, um, veterinary-specific factors as well. We're not in charge of the decision-making, right? Um, as veterinarians, there's a client, there's somebody else who that we most of the time have to go between. One of the things I like about shelter medicine is, is sometimes that, that piece is removed and we can make those decisions how we feel good about it, but um, not everybody has that luxury and depends on the, the, the specific patient that you're working with. And what about technicians? They might even have a, a kind of a third, a third step. What if they disagree with what the veterinarian wants to do, what the client wants to do? There's a whole other layer in there for them to, to deal through. And then, of course, daily ethical dilemmas. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard this saying, just because you can doesn't mean you should dress your cats up. And, ties. Um, but we have daily ethical dilemmas. I mean, it really happens, happens daily where we're trying to think about what's the right thing to do, um, how do we make the right decision. In private practice, you're looking at different treatment options and protocols, you know, just because there's a miracle treatment out there, should we try to pursue that? In shelters, we might have to deal with animal ownership issues, or who has a right to know about infectious disease risk when you talk about informed adoptions? Who should you tell about this? How much of a big deal should you make out of it? Um, all those things create this, this extra layer that we have to deal with um, on a daily basis that most other folks, uh, most other professions don't have to. Then, of course, there's a lack of public understanding. Um, again, in my internet search, you can find um, things like this. Veterinarians are money-grubbing pigs that suck. Uh, 
this one came up, I was kind of surprised. It's like an image search. You see Dr. Evil, I will be your veterinarian today. Um, and this one was um, interesting. So when I, um, again, one of the early iterations of this talk, when I was working at UF, one of our faculty members was actually nominated for the veterinarian, America's Favorite Veterinarian Award through the ABMF that year. Um, this was a few years back. And um, some of you may remember that this, th this actual, the whole event, you know, it's supposed to be this great thing, celebrating veterinarians, celebrating the profession, uh, recognizing an individual's contribution, and, and you know, it's this great sort of, I think it's even a fundraiser because it was ABMF that was happening. Um, they had to cancel the whole, the whole contest that year because there was such intense cyberbullying of one of the contestants that was up for, for the award. And that, that was coming from the public. Um, so there's this, this lack of public understanding of what we do and what we're all about that contributes to these issues. And then the last one um, is that negativity bias thing. So this is the idea that negative experiences have a greater effect on our behavior and cognition than equally intense neutral or positive experiences. We remember the bad stuff and we forget about the good stuff that happens. So, um, there's a you know really good evolutionary reason for this. You know we're meant to identify the snake in the grass and identify the poison berries and all these these sort of things so that we can go on to survive. But it does have negative impacts on our lives um, as we live them today. It, it impacts our attention, our learning, our memory, and decision making. And these have an impact on how we we function in daily work. So um, how do we combat all these different things? No matter how you want to kind of want to characterize it. Um, we have to look at compassion satisfaction. I think of that as the other side of the scale. So whatever you kind of load on this side, compassion satisfaction helps balancing it out. And that's the idea of the pleasure being derived from being able to do our work well. And so um, I didn't show you, there's some um, corresponding data to this as far as scores of burnout and secondary traumatic stress in these populations. I didn't share that in this presentation, but um, that study that looked at uh, burnout and stress in ER nurses and pediatric nurses, they also looked at compassion satisfaction in those groups. And they found that in the ER nurses, really high compassion satisfaction overall, and it was associated with nurses that had really high or felt they had really high manager support. Um, in the pediatric nurse group, the vast majority of them had moderate to high compassion satisfaction. Those that had low compassion satisfaction were in particular uh, categories, ages 18 to 39. They were staff nurses versus other types of assignments. They had six to 10 years of experience, and they worked in medical um, and surgical units as opposed to um, being in, uh, in a pediatric ICU or being um, particularly assigned to surgery only or oncology only. Um, and then there was a third study that looked specifically at critical care nurses. 57% had average compassion satisfaction, 43% had high. And in females, it was greater than males. And I pulled this chart out because I think it's interesting. There was an association with education level here as well. Um, those that had high levels of compassion satisfaction were more likely um, to have an associate's uh, degree. So that's the, um, these guys right here. I used to have little stars on here. Sorry, I took it out. Um, the associate degree as compared to um, the master's and uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, high levels of compassion satisfaction were also more likely in groups that were over 50. Um, aged over 50 than compared to the younger groups. And then high levels are also likely in folks that worked in an ICU versus those that worked in mixed wards. So there's an interesting pattern there with, with people working in lots of different areas versus focusing on one area. We, see, we saw a little bit of a pattern, at least in human health care. So I show you all this sort of human data now because there's really not a whole lot of data about veterinarians um, in, this, in this area. So I ask, what about veterinarians? And I came across this. I don't know if any of you guys are on this. Not one more vet Facebook page. This is not an endorsement. I don't find it particularly helpful for me. Maybe it works for you guys. I find it to be very kind of negative and um, maybe a good place for people to go and vent, but not a very productive place. Um, that said, somebody posted this survey that I thought was interesting. It says, just a quick question for you guys. If you could go back to your younger self, the little you who first wanted to be a vet, what would you say? Would you encourage? Would you offer words of warning? Or would you smack yourself in the face until you swore off the idea completely? What do you guys think the responses were? So these really are the first nine responses that were on after that post. Only two of the nine <laughs> said they would, they would definitely do it, and they were happy um, with that choice. And the other ones are a variety of other. Um, other responses there. So, and I wasn't 
super surprised to see that. I thought it was interesting, but I've certainly seen that amongst my friends and colleagues. I've said that myself. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't surprised, but it's kind of sad to look at it that way and realize that a, lot, a large proportion of the profession is not happy with that choice. Um, there are a couple surveys of veterinary job satisfaction, so I don't know if that's exactly the same as compassion satisfaction, but it's a measure that we have. And then uh, what they looked at in those studies, uh, or what they found rather, was that uh, veterinarians were happier than the general population. Uh, males were, general, or were happier than females, were more satisfied with their jobs, and there were positive correlations with age, years, and job, and income. Some of the individual factors that were found in, in the studies that looked at job satisfaction are listed here. So positive um, things that were positively associated, having, having a, a, an appropriate level of responsibility at work, having a, having a level of responsibility at work, um, having freedom to make decisions, good physical conditions. They enjoyed the actual type of work they were doing. They enjoyed their colleagues. They felt that they had a career, uh, a path moving forward in that, in that position. Some of the negative things were lack of ha uh, promotional opportunities. We're seeing the finances come in again, a pay rate, um, hours, amount of work. And then if colleagues is on the other side too, of course, that can go um, either way. So right after this slide here, um, and take a break now before we get into the, the second section, but um, we can go ahead and take the full 15 minutes, but I would encourage you to sort of think about that as we um, go through the break and maybe share with a neighbor. Think about what brings you satisfaction in your work. Because it's important to know what those things are, to be able to identify them, talk about them, to help balance out that scale of some of the negatives that we're going to experience. So. Think about that. When we come back, we're going to talk more specifically about some of the signs and symptoms we would see in ourselves and others, and look at um, a, a strategy for uh, sort of dealing with those things and setting up ourselves for success in our careers. So.